Good evening and welcome chocolate enthusiasts. Um, uh, thank you for coming to this evening's chocolate truffle workshop made possible by the Friends of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. My name is Chris Gray. I serve as the Adult Services Librarian in Lafayette. Before we begin, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, tonight's workshop is not set up with the expectation that you make the truffles as you go along. As you'll see, there's some specific equipment and techniques uh, to learn about first. We'll be recording this workshop and we will post it to the YouTube pages for the Contra Costa County Library and the Friends of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center, hopefully by the end of this week. I will be sending you a follow-up email with that link when it's available. We, uh, we won't have an open chat column uh, tonight, but if you have questions as we go along, we ask you to put them into the, uh, type them into the Q&A box. Uh, you'll see towards the bottom um, of your Zoom screen, there's several buttons. So not the chat box, but the Q&A box. So we'll be monitoring that and we'll address selected questions during uh, some periodic breaks during the presentation. And if your question isn't answered, you will have an opportunity to, uh, to email it to our hosts. I'm going to include their email address with the follow-up email uh, that I sent to you all. all. Right, so Don and Ellen are longtime supporters of the Lafayette Library. Don was involved with the planning and design of the innovative Lafayette Library and Learning Center, which opened its doors in the fall of 2009. He has also served on the board of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center Foundation. Ellen is the volunteer coordinator of the popular Wonders of the World, or WOW, museum lecture series sponsored by the Friends of the Lafayette Library. She's also on the board of the Friends and served as its president uh, from 2015 to 2017. When not making truffles, Don and Ellen enjoy playing with their ever-present border collies, making music and art, and engaging in a wide variety of community activities. And with that, I will hand it over to our capable hosts and thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good evening. And thank you all for joining us for our first ever online truffle making demonstration. By the end of this webinar, we hope you feel emboldened to make chocolate truffles in your own kitchen. We are your chefs tonight, Ellen Reinches and my husband, Don Tatson, and we've have over 35 years experience making truffles in our own home kitchen. Prior to the pandemic, we hosted in-person truffle making workshops at the Lafayette Library for several years. We enjoy sharing our learning and recipes with cho uh, fellow chocolate lovers. And Don and I will be sharing the screen tonight so you'll see both of us, but hopefully only one talking at a time. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge and thank the Contra Costa Library System for announcing this webinar across the county and for all they've done to develop digital content and provide curbside pickup services at the branch libraries during the past year. We also wanna thank the Friends of the Lafayette Library, which have underwritten the in-person truffle making workshops that we've done at the Lafayette branch. And we also wanna thank the Lafayette Library and Learning Center Foundation, which helped market this webinar as well as our in-person classes and does much to make the library the success that it is. Making truffles started as a small hobby and eventually grew to epic proportions during the holiday season. There was probably one year when we and a friend made over 5,000 truffles in our kitchen in November and December. And while we've never sold our truffles, we have developed a brand for them. We name our dogs after mountains and everything else in the house after the dogs, hence mountain dog truffles. Our last six dogs have been border collies and here are our current partners in truffles. That's Cloud over there on the left. There's a Cloud Peak in Wyoming and Cloud's Rest in Yosemite National Park. And there's Greylock in the middle and he's named after Mount Greylock in Massachusetts. And there's Tanaya, our youngest border collie on the right. And she is named after Tanaya Peak in Yosemite. We learned how to make truffles on a really bad dark and stormy night back in February, 1984. A friend of mine came to California on a business trip. She called me up to say that she and some colleagues were coming to my house and one of them was going to teach us how to make truffles. And as they say, the rest is history. Making truffles can be a fun family project with parents, grandparents, children, aunts, uncles, you name it. We encourage you to try our recipe 
and then make it your own brand with flavors you like. There are a number of places where heating and cooling are involved, so the total elapsed time can be several hours. So you can start it in the morning and finish it in the late afternoon or at the end of the day, or start uh, one day and finish it on the next. When we do this in person, we stage the event by bringing chocolate at different phases to keep the demonstration moving along. And that's pretty much how we're uh, going to do tonight's presentation. We have a few disclaimers. We're not professional chefs and we're not TV chefs. We do mention a few uh, brands and stores, but this is for information only and not for any endorsement. And the big difference from the in-person event is we will not be dipping truffles with you. Usually when we do this at the library, we're in a room uh, that accommodates about 20 people. And uh, the last part of the presentation is actually sitting down and having people dip their own. And then we hear all the laughs and giggles start with how much fun they have with that. So tonight's program uh, will take you through how we do Mountain Dog Truffles from start to finish. The library sent out uh, some printed materials, uh, a gear list, uh, because the way we make truffles, truffles is kind of like going on an expedition. And there's a master recipe guide that we call the how-tos of Mountain Dog Truffles, and then an ingredient guide for the different flavors that we make. You may want to make uh, different flavors than we do, but will, the relative proportions will, should remain about the same. Uh, we'll take um, questions at several points uh, during the uh, demonstration. We'll take five minutes after Don finishes uh, his discussion of how he makes the middles. Then we'll take another five minutes after I do the uh, discussion of how to dip them. And then we'll take more at the end. So Don's gonna start off talking about the various gear that we use. Thank you, Alan. And before I start talking about the gear, I just want to welcome all of you to our, this truffle making workshop. We know that there are a lot of people from Lafayette here, some from the rest of Contra Costa County, the Bay Area, and we know there are people from across the country. So we appreciate all of your participation. You're going to see that this is something you can do as an individual or as a team. We tend to do it as a team, but um, individuals work. There's several advantages to work doing this as a team. First is that you can say you've done a batch when you've actually only had to do half the work because your team member will do the other half. Second is you can exchange comments along the way. So for example, some of my favorites are, those are really good middles and they dipped really well, or that's a really good set of dipped truffles. And, but my favorite probably is, that truffle's a little misshapen after dipping. I think we should split it and just eat it now. So the gear is, we're gonna talk about each category, but it's divided into six broad categories for measuring, mixing, heating, some special tools, dipping and storing and packaging. And that's sort of, that's the order that you're gonna use it in. Now, you may not have exactly what we have, but you probably have some substitutes in your kitchen. And I'll mention some of those as we go through. So let's start with the measuring gear. The thing we use the most is a kitchen scale. The recipe is lists things by weight in general. So a kitchen scale comes in very handy. There are a few things where you can use a measuring spoon. There's a lot of mixing that goes on to mix the various kinds of chocolate. And the three items in the upper row are the mixing utensils that you use to make the middles and the three in the lower row are the ones you use for dipping. So because we heat the chocolate in a, in a microwave, we have microwavable bowls, flexible spatulas. And the reason we use flexible spatulas versus spoons is that way you can get more of the chocolate and flavorings out of the container. So more of it goes into the truffle. And then we use a stand mixer for both mixing them and whipping them. You could substitute a hand mixer and you can substitute a spoon or a fork. But if you're gonna use anything other than a span, stand mixer, make a smaller batch because they just don't have the power to get through it. Ellen will sh show that she uses a small microwavable bowl for the outside chocolate, a spoon, and a mini wire whisk. Now, as I said, we, we heat the chocolate to just above melting temperatures using a microwave. And the advantage of a microwave is that you can set it and forget it. 
in my case, I can set it, walk outside, play fetch with the border collies, and come back and be pretty assured that the chocolate will have gotten to just the right consistency. If you don't have a microwave or you don't trust yours, you can use a double boiler or you can make your own double boiler with nested saucepans, but then you're going to have to pay a lot more attention to what's going on. There's some special tools, for example, a nut grinder, a dipping utensil, a melon scoop, eyedropper for the uh, intense flavored oils, and many electric grinder or blender that we use to chop up things like marmalade. There's for dipping and storing, there's a cookie sheet, there are airtight storage containers, there's parchment paper, and there's aluminum foil. We use the special crinkle foil but you can use the flat foil as well. Alan's gonna say a few words now about chocolate and your pets. So chocolate is highly toxic to dogs and cats. So please make sure that your pets can't get to your truffles and ingredients. Dogs seem to have more of an interest in uh, sweet things than cats do. So if you have canine companions like we do, try to shoo them out of the kitchen if they're nosing around when you're making your truffles. So now let's get into the recipe. Well, the first ingredient is not surprisingly chocolate. And in Mountain Dog Truffles, there are three kinds of chocolates. There's the middle chocolate, which is a bittersweet chocolate of 64 to 70% cocoa with some unsweetened chocolate often added to make it even darker. But if you don't like your chocolate that dark, you can use other kinds of chocolate like milk chocolate. And Ellen at the end will talk about using white chocolate. There's coating chocolate, which is also known as compound outside or dipping chocolate. All of the truffles that we use come from Guitard uh, Chocolate, which is a San Francisco company with its now fifth generation of family management. Guitard is well known for being the chocolate supplier to Seize Candy and Mountain Dog Truffles, <laughs> among other places. We started out getting 10 pound bars of chocolate that we had to break apart and now we've discovered through our vendor that these also come in, in wafers that are about one inch across. Now we can recognize these wafers from across the room by their size and color, but fortunately the boxes they come in are labeled. And you can also use other brands and we did that at the very beginning. So here in the supermarket, you can find lots of different choices and they may, may come in bars or wafers or powders. So every truffle has chocolate. So what differentiates one from another is the flavorings. And first to, to, to the chocolate, you're gonna put in heavy cream and I'll describe that. But your flavorings can be any combination of liqueurs, jams, marmalades, oils, compound flavorings, syrups, chips, nuts and coconut. And if you look at the flavor guide, you'll see what we use. And as Ellen said, experiment and come up with flavors that you like. So now let's talk about the process. I'll talk about how I make the middle step-by-step. -step. Ellen will describe, discuss the step-by-step -step approach to dipping. It's all gonna be illustrated with a few short videos. And occasionally, when the steps aren't quite straightforward, one of the mountain dogs will appear on the page to let you know that this is a special step. So the first step in making the middles is melt the chocolate and cream together. So the recipe we're giving you is about 16 ounces of 64% chocolate and one ounce of unsweetened chocolate to make it a bit darker, or 17 ounces of 70% chocolate or other combinations to your taste. And you mix that with six ounces of heavy cream. As I mentioned before, all of our measurements are by weight. The first thing you do is you put the chocolate and the cream in a microwavable dish. And then if there's one rule of making truffles, it is do not burn the chocolate. There's no return from doing that and you have to start over. So given that we're gonna heat ours in a microwave, we, we always heat it on levels two and three, sometimes even one, which is the lowest levels in our microwave, which has 10 levels. So for our microwave, if I put in 17 ounces of inside chocolate and six ounces of cream, and I set it for about two and a half minutes on level three and then nine minutes on level two, I can go away, play a little fetch with the border collies and I'll come back and it'll almost always have melted properly. If it hasn't, then you can wait a few minutes to see if the remaining chocolate melts into the mix. If not, you can put it into the microwave at low power for an additional minute. 
So if you want to make a fractional portion of the recipe, go ahead. So for example, here's an illustration for half a pound of raspberry truffles. So you start out with eight and a half ounces of bittersweet inside chocolate in your microwavable dish. Three ounces of cream as opposed to six. One and a half ounces of raspberry preserves and one and a half ounces of chambord liqueur, which is what we use. A little bit of a raspberry compound flavoring. And again, you can mix the proportions and two drops of raspberry flavored oil. So the first thing you wanna do is, is put these two together. So in step in the bottom left picture, you'll see the cream and chocolate combined before heating. You then run them through the microwave and it looks like the picture on the right where the cream has um, melted the, the chocolate. Now there are other recipes to make truffles. You can do it with butter um, but cream and butter are the most frequently used. And we've just, we were taught how to do it with cream and we've stuck with it. So your next step is now to add the flavorings. So the way we do that is we'll put the melted chocolate and cream in a stand mixer bowl and add the measured flavorings into the chocolate and cream mixture. And there's a reason we don't add the flavorings into the microwave bowl. And that is we wanna make sure as much of the flavoring gets into the final truffles as possible. And there's always a chance some will get left in the microwavable bowl. So we find that using six ounces of combined fluid and jam to 17 ounces of chocolate works well. So basically you're using six ounces of cream and another six ounces of flavoring. If you use too much more, then the middles won't set well. And this causes problems for the person dipping. If you use too much alcohol, that tends to overwhelm the other flavors. So over time, we substituted more jams and syrup for alcohol. But that's, again, personal preference. So the next step is you want to mix everything together. So you use the wire whisk attachment on your stand mixer and just stir at low speed until all the ingredients are thoroughly mixed. And then use the spatula to clean the sides of the bowl and get the stuff on the sides mixed in too. Some tips. I just use a low speed setting so the mixture doesn't splatter. The ingredients are too warm to mix in air at this stage, so there's no benefit of a higher speed unless you want to turn your kitchen brown. And, but if you have, don't have a stand mixer, you know, electric hand mixer will work or hand mixing tools will work, but use a smaller batch because you need the power to get through it. So now step four, you'll notice Cloud is watching us here because this is an important step is you want to let the mixture cool and then you whip it. So what you want to do is to get the mixture to just several degrees above room temperature. And that for us typically takes 30 to 90 minutes. And while it's doing that, you want to mix it up occasionally. So I let it rest for 10 or 15, 20 minutes initially, and then mix it on medium speed for 10 or 15 seconds and run the spatula around the sides of the bowl. If you found after 90 to 120 minutes, it hasn't gotten any thicker, you have chocolate sauce, really tasty chocolate sauce. If for some reason you, have, you get called away and you come back and the mixture is too hard and you can't whip it to get it soft enough, then you can reheat it very slowly. So either by putting it back in the glass bowl and into the microwave at very low power or place the metal bowl in some hot water and, and just stir it around with your spatula frequently so that it all heats up. So once the mixture has thickened, now you turn the mixture, mixer to top speed and you whip the middles until the mixture turns lighter in color. And we'll show you a video of that. And that means that it's set. So at this point, the mixture has become so thick that it barely drops off the wire whisk. Again, if it doesn't begin to set after 30 or 45 seconds of whipping at high speed, let it cool some more. If it never sets, again, you've got chocolate sauce. You want to avoid problems of under dipping or over, under whipping or over whipping. If they're under whipped, they're too soft and they're difficult to dip. If they're over whipped, they can become too crumbly, they're quote dry and they're also difficult to dip. It's important to keep the dipper happy. All right, so now we have some brief videos to show you various stages. So the first video on the upper left just shows the initial mixing and you can see Hopefully the mixture just fall off the wire whisk because it's still pretty warm. The second video taken a little while later 
still shows that it's fairly warm, if I can get the mixer up, and it's, it's falling off not quite as fast as in the first round. Now in the bottom video, you'll see that it comes up and it doesn't fall off at all, and now it's time to go to high-speed mixing. But we've got a better video here to show you what the high-speed mixing looks like and what the, it looks like after it's done. So you turn it off, if you lift it up, you'll see that it's lighter in color than it was before and that it's not falling off the wire whisk. So that's, you're done with, with mixing. And that's really the hardest thing that I have to do in terms of making the mills. Next item is you scoop them. So you take out your cookie sheet and some parchment paper using a, a small melon scoop or a spoon or whatever, scoop out an amount for each truffle middle we use a uh, scoop that's about four tenths of an ounce in size, and that yields us about 60 to 80 truffles. And at this point, you can pack them together so I can always get all of those on one cookie sheet. And when we started doing this before, we used to cool the mixture after it was whipped, and even put it in the refrigerator. That was actually not a good idea. Um, because they're much easier to scoop if you do it right as you finish whipping. If you wait too long, the mixture hardens and it becomes more difficult to scoop, but it does build up your arm muscle. The other thing that I do is I scrape the scoop against the side of the bowl when I take it out, and that flattens one side of the truffle middle. You place the flat side down on the cookie sheet, and that helps the truffles from rolling around later on. So here's, here's a demonstration of scooping. And you can see I'm rubbing the scoop against the side of the bowl so I have a flat side. So now you do want to cool it. You want to refrigerate it for a minimum of one hour, but you can refrigerate it for longer if you like. If you're going to leave them for any substantial length of time, we suggest that you cover them with foil or some other um, Air, airtight cover to limit them from drying out. So the next step is rolling them. So here all you want to do is just roll them quickly enough so that you take out the, the, the dimples and things like that. But you don't want to do it for so long that you start to get chocolate stuck all over your hands. And the way I do it is you'd like to roll them with something cool. So I rinse my hands in cold water and I clean i also clean them periodically in cold water if I get too much chocolate on them. And I pat my hands dry on a paper towel, but I leave them damp and cool. And then I roll each truffle for, truffle for only a few seconds so they don't become too soft and too much chocolate melts on your hands. So here's a video showing the rolling process. And this is at actual speed. And then to save time when I'm doing this, I drop them right, not on the cookie sheet, but right into the storage container because the next thing you want to do is, let's just slide advances, there you go, is refrigerate them in an airtight storage container until they're ready to dip. And again, not only do you want them to be in an airtight storage container, you might want to put, put some foil or wrap around them to help keep them from drying out. If you're mixing different flavors in the same container, I suggest that you separate and label them so they don't get mixed up. And we're now happy to take some questions about making the middles. Yeah, it looks like we've got a few questions here. Um, Ellen, Don, would you like me to read these to you? Sure, go ahead. Go All ahead. right. Uh, so uh, one attendee asks, can I use cocoa powder instead of wafers? Well, that's a good, we have not used that. I'd probably suggest that you uh, look online in recipe uh, uh, books and see if you see references to that. We've always used either the wafers or block chocolate. Hmm. Okay. You can always try just melting a small amount of cocoa powder in a little bit of cream and see what happens. Yeah, I, I've often seen truffles rolled on the outside with cocoa powder, but I don't know about using them on the inside. Okay. Uh, we have a question. I'm not sure if I understand this, but you might. Uh, the question is just what is inside chocolate? 
Ah, well, inside chocolate is the um, is the uh, dark. We use bittersweet chocolate, and it doesn't have some of the compounds in it that keep the outside chocolate from melting in your hand as easily. Okay. So it's really it's really our terminology. You know, he makes the insides and I make the outside. Right. And so we use different chocolates for uh, each one of those steps. For people who are uh, candy making aficionados, the mixture that goes inside uh, candies is often called ganache. And so that's a term you might see on cooking sites. Gotcha. Uh, we have an attendee that asks, um, uh, when scooping, does the chocolate stick to the scoop? Well, a little sometimes, and that's why I use a scoop that has a spring on it that helps eject the uh, the truffle. And sometimes I'll have to squeeze it two or three times to get it to come out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can they be rolled wearing nitrile gloves? Which I, I believe are, are non-latex gloves. Yeah. We've not tried that. Uh, I don't know, know about enough what's in the gloves to know whether uh, it's a good idea or not. Okay. Yeah, I would think you'd want to at least wash them to get and any... You still want to wash them to make sure they're clean and cool. Um, we have someone that asks, how long can the finished middles be stored before coating? So I, I try to do it... If, if he finishes a batch uh, one day, I try to either do them that night or the next day. Uh, there have been times he's gotten way far ahead of me when we've been making a lot of batches and they've even covered up, they do tend to dry out. So I wouldn't want to leave them more than a couple of days. Uh, and, and if I left them that long, I'd want them to be well wrapped. Okay. And we've got a, a handful of questions here uh, specifically about ingredients. Um, uh, I'm going to throw a couple of them at you. Uh, where do you get flavored oils? Can you use... So we're going to come to, uh, in the, towards the end, we're going to talk about where we get things. Okay. And so I think there's also a handout that describes where we get a lot of the stuff we use. Right. The, the, yeah, at the, uh, toward the end of the handout that has the um, recipe, there's a whole section on where we have gotten ingredients through the years. Okay. Um, uh, questions about the chocolate. Can you use guitar chocolate chips? And can you use the, um, the Trader Joe's, uh, the pound plus 72% dark chocolate bars? So, uh, so certainly you can use the chocolate bars and I'm gonna address later using chocolate chips. So uh, hopefully people can uh, ho hold on that one till the end because I've got a frequently asked question section and uh, that's one of the ones in there. Perfect. Um, and do you separate each layer in storage at the end of the process? So I separate them by pounds. So for example, if um, you know, I've got a small container and a couple of pounds in it, then I'll have a, a roll of wax paper between the pounds, but I'll allow the truffles af after they've been rolled to come in contact with each other. When mm -hmm. Ellen has dipped them, and before we store them, we also wrap them in aluminum foil and then we just put them in a bin. Okay. And then, yeah, I think we had just um, one more question, which was about ingredients asking if we could use uh, an extract instead of an oil. I assume I, like an yeah, alcohol. I, 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 I would think so. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we move on to the um, um, dipping and then we can come back to more questions at the end. All right, so um, before I get into the specifics of dipping, I wanna talk about a few tools. So one is a dipping utensil. So when we first started off, we didn't have most of the things you see on the gear list. We've acquired those gradually over time. And we started off making uh, the truffles with uh, forks and uh, spoons. So a dinner fork I used for dipping. Then I found this uh, dipping utensil that had, uh, it's got a, a wooden handle and a circular metal basket attached to a metal stem. And that's, I probably bought that sometime in the late 1980s. So since then, looking online, there are more styles and types available now. 
There are ones with deep baskets, spiral baskets, uh, metal, plastic. Uh, I've tried the uh, plastic ones and I find I prefer the metal because more heft gives me more control over the truffle. Uh, sometimes you see these sold in the sets with other kinds of tools for candy making. Um, so there's lot, lots of choices out there. I still prefer this one, but that's because I've been using it for so long, it's what I'm used to. Uh, you might try something else and like it better. Then there's uh, dipping, and I call this section Goldilock and the three bowls. So when I'm dipping, I'm holding a bowl in one hand and I'm dipping with the other. So it's got to be something that's comfortable uh, for my hand and also um, uh, it, it, the um, middle uh, works, uh, swirls around well in the bowl. So for example, the, the bowl on the left is an, old, uh, an older uh, deep Corel bowl. That's about four inches across at the bottom, six inches across at the top, and two and three quarter inches deep. So I have found this bowl too deep and too big. The middle bowl is like a soup bowl or cereal bowl. And it's about five inches across at the bottom, so it's wider, six inches across at the top, and it's shallower of about one and three quarter inches deep. And I have found this bowl too wide. Then the right hand bowl is one that I have found at some craft fairs. And I believe it's called an egg bowl. And it's uh, sold by a lot of people who make pottery. And we do have a reference in the, uh, one of the handouts for the gentleman that we have run into at several craft fairs. Uh, and so this uh, has the benefit of it. It has a handle, a spout, and for me, it has good dimensions. So it's about three inches across at the bottom, four inches across at the top, and about two and a half inches deep. So for this Goldilocks, that bowl is just right. So the first thing I do on the dipping is get a few things in place ahead of time. So the first is preparing the cookie sheet. Um, you need one that's completely flat and cover it with parchment paper or wax paper. Uh, and then I, that's, there's that crinkly uh, uh, foil, and it probably wasn't crinkly at one point in time, but I, I want to have a place to put uh, chocolate covered utensils when I'm not using them. So I might put a piece of foil or a small plate near where I'm going to be dipping. Okay, so now, now the rubber is hitting the road now, we're going to be dipping, and there is Greylock overseeing the first part of this. So the first part is melting the chocolate. So I filled that dipping bowl with outside chocolate and one ounce of unsweetened chocolate. So I think the bowl that I showed you that I like uh, fits about 12 ounces of those wafers. And I must say at this point, I'm not measuring, I'm doing everything by sight and I just kind of toss a batch of the wafers in and then toss a bit of the unsweetened in. Then I will heat the chocolate in the microwave at a low to medium setting for about a minute. Then I take the bowl out and stir the chocolate with a spoon or that small wire uh, whisk. Uh, and actually, the first time around, it won't have started to melt, but I do move the chocolate around a bit because I don't want uh, any of the chocolate to burn. And uh, so that this kind of keeps the uh, uh, temperature even across all the chocolate in the, in the bowl. So then I would go back and I'd repeat the heating again, this time for 30 seconds, and then the stirring, and then repeat a few more times until the chocolate has uh, uh, melted and been stirred to a smooth consistency. And I'm going to show you some videos in a, a moment to uh, demonstrate this. A few tips, uh, heat only until a good tip dipping consistency is reached. The chocolate gets too hot, the truffle milk middles will melt too much into the dipping chocolate. And if the middles have a liqueur and too much of the liqueur melts into the chocolate, the dipping chocolate may seize, that's S-E-I-Z-E, -E, which means that it suddenly becomes, in my mind, strangely gooey and it won't coat the middle properly. And I haven't figured out a way to fix this. I've seen some discussions on the internet of people who've tried to uh, figure out what to do about it and they may have a method that works for them. But we just say, let's you know, use that chocolate for something else and we'll start over. All right, so, uh, 
The picture on the upper left shows the wafers in the uh, dipping bowl. As I mentioned, it's about 12 ounce compound to one ounce unsweetened. Okay, then, uh, so this is a video showing after <clears throat> probably a couple to three rounds of heating and cooling. You can see that the wafers still have a lot of their uh, shape, but, uh, but clearly there is some melting going on. And then after a few more, there clearly is a lot of melting going on. And if I stir it, I can actually uh, cause more melting. And they start losing uh, their shape. It might still be a little lumpy. And if that's the case, I might put it back in for another 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, maybe not the full 30 because I don't want to risk um, uh, burning it. So the last video is what it should look like when it's done. Smooth and creamy. All right. All right, we've melted and now we're going to dip. And uh, there's Tanaya overseeing this. And there's a, a page of steps here and then a batch of... Um, uh, tips, and then we'll get to the videos. So I put a middle into the dipping chocolate. And with the dipping utensil, quickly swirl the middle around in the chocolate until it's completely covered by the chocolate. And what I try to do is put the basket of the dipping utensil underneath the middle. If there's a rounder side and a flatter side, and if we remember Don was uh, scraping uh, uh, the middle uh, as he was taking it out of the bowl, I try to place the basket under the rounder side. <clears throat> and then in one movement, lift the middle out of the bowl and flip it onto the cookie sheet, flatter side down. And you can add a topping if desired. And again, a dipping fork can be used if you don't have a dipping utensil. So for tips, so successful dipping requires good hand-eye coordination and fine motor skills. And as with many things in life, Practice, 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 and your technique will improve as you get a feel for swirling and dipping. If the dipping chocolate is too warm, the middles may skate when put on the cookie sheet, or some of the chocolate will slide off and form feet, which can be cut off with a knife after the truffle has set. Feet can also form if there's too much dipping chocolate on the truffle, and this can be avoided by letting some of the chocolate fall back into the bowl before flipping it onto the cookie sheet. And always, always, always feel free to eat your mistakes. A few more tips. So if you're going to be putting a topping like nuts or chips or fruit, uh, these need to be put into place before the dipping chocolate has set on the truffle. So I usually dip two truffles at a time and then put a topping on and then dip two more, then put the topping, et cetera, until I'm done with the batch. If there's any dipping chocolate left in the bowl after a batch of middles is made, then I will save it for a few days unless I feel that it's really been contaminated by too strong a flavor or by nuts. Uh, and also I do keep uh, bowls separate for middles that have nuts and middles that don't have nuts since many people have nut allergies. And I also put coconut into the category with nuts. And if I'm going to be, uh, dipping nuts and non-nuts, you know, kind of in the same uh, period of time. I'll make sure that I have completely cleaned any of the gear that's been used with the nuts. All right, so here's some videos. So on the upper left, I've dipped one truffle. And now I'm putting another one into the bowl, swirling it around, putting the basket underneath, lifting it up and flipping it over. And here's another one. And one of the things I'm doing, you know, as I'm just before it goes on is let a little fall back into the bowl. So the next video is largely the same, except I've used enough of the chocolate that I think I'm better uh, angle on the uh, inside of the bowl. So depending how close I can put the truffles on the cookie sheet, I'd say I get 40 plus or minus per sheet. And if I'm uh, dipping one of those uh, full pounds of middles, I know I'm gonna have to go to a second cookie sheet and I may also have to go to another uh, bowl of chocolate. 
On the bottom right, there's a picture of a truffle that has skated. So that could be because the chocolate was too warm or there was too much of it, or maybe when it hit the cookie sheet, it was at a slightly odd angle and just kept going. So, you know, that's not, not a problem. It tastes fine. You just have to uh, wait until it has set and cut off the uh, excess. So then I let the truffles set on the cookie sheet for at least an hour before wrapping or moving them. Uh, the truffles will set at room temperature as long as it's not too hot. And when we're working in the kitchen here, our kitchen is probably not above 70 degrees. And what I have found if truffles are moved to a refrigerator to set, I seem to find that there's a risk that the outside chocolate will crack a little bit and some of the inside chocolate will ooze out. It won't affect the flavor at all, but uh, if you're giving them away, you know, it might not look like, you know, our finest effort. Okay, so are there any questions on uh, this part of the presentation? Looks like we've got a couple, Ellen, and uh, everybody, if you have other questions, now go ahead and type them into the Q&A section. Okay. Uh, one person asks, uh, what would be the proportions for a small batch? So I think uh, the first one, first one, when I first learned, we were making about a third of a pound. So if you look at the ingredient guide and divide everything by three, uh, you'd you know, make, you know, make about a third of a pound, and that should make about 20 truffles. And we were making them you know, using the uh, uh, dinner fork method for dipping. And, uh, and so that's, that's pretty much what we got. Okay. Uh, one person asks, how would you know when you have burned chocolate? Oh, you'll know. <laughs> you will, it will smell like it has burned and, 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 and taste. And it boils. And it tastes weird. You'll know. Right. And I, and I will say that one of the time, one of the first times we did the um, uh, tr truffle in-person class in the library, we were we borrowed a microwave, and it wasn't one we were used to, and we didn't know the settings very well, and we burned a batch of chocolate for our class. Now we had brought brought extra chocolate with us just in case we did something like that. But I will say that uh, after that, we also went out and bought a small portable microwave to bring to do classes at the library. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because I've helped you haul that microwave in. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Sometimes when we've gone to the library, I feel we brought half our kitchen with us. <laughs> uh, one attendee asks, you don't mention tempering. How do you prevent bloom? Ah, well, so, um, I actually have a section on the end in the, in the fr frequently asked questions about tempering. So if we can hold off on that one. And, okay. and, and the first re uh, answer is that we use the compound chocolate because that means you, it's, it's a uh, slightly different formula and you don't have to temper it. Okay. And this, uh, this might be covered in the last section, this next question, but are your truffles shiny after they dry? And if so, how do you make them shiny? Do you add something to the chocolate? We don't add anything to the chocolate. Um, I think they're reasonably shiny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not as shiny as some, but uh, they don't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> Your, the wrappers are very shiny. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, do you need to use the cookie sheet or could you just put the truffles on parchment wax paper right on the countertop? Uh, you could, but if you're going to be moving them around at all, uh, you know, it's sort of, I'm, I'm um, usually working on one counter and then putting them to set somewhere else in the kitchen that I don't think the dogs can get to them. Mm. Good call. And whereas when I'm rolling the truffles, it doesn't make any difference if they touch each other. Ellen doesn't like the, the dip <laughs> truffles to touch each other until she's had a chance to wrap them. Because mm -hmm. right, the, they, they will kind of, you know, nick each other and it won't look as good. Uh, we've got, let's see here, um, a question. Um, are the compound chocolate wafers for the outsides, are those different than the original 64 to 70% wafers? Yeah, yes, the, so the, um, the outside chocolate made by Guitar is called Guitar Appeals. It's a product that's uh, a compound chocolate. Uh, and there's also a, a company called Wilton that makes a lot of uh, uh, candy making, um, products for kind of people who do crafts and candy in their home. And Wilton's are called Wilton Candy Melts. And I'm sure there are other brands out there. 
uh, and I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit. So on the compound chocolate, it doesn't have cocoa butter in it. It's got a different oil. Okay. Um, how many times can you melt or I guess remelt your dipping chocolate before you can no longer use it? Well, if you're doing several batches. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like start, you know, sourdough starter. You end up with a little bit and you, you know, add more to it. So I'd say if I'm making a pound of chocolate uh, middles, you know, to dip them, it probably takes one and a half of those bowls that I use. So I might be, you know, doing it a few times ahead, but you know, after a while, I just, I, you know, I've done so many different flavors that I kind of think it's probably been a little bit contaminated. Okay. Um, I think you so covered this earlier. You're getting, you're getting another question ready. Let, let me ask Ellen one. So I said that when I melt the inside chocolate, I use very low power on the microwave and I do it for enough time to melt it at one shot. What kind of power settings do you use on the microwave? So I think it, it depends on the microwave and everyone's microwave is different. So uh, we've got um, microwave that went into this house 30 years ago. I probably used the half setting, which would be five out of 10. Uh, but when we've done them at the library and that's a newer microwave and maybe it's more powerful and I'm using an even lower uh, setting on that one. So it might be at three. Okay. Um, uh, there's one question about, um, you know, can you make a plain chocolate truffle without any liqueur added? And if so, would you add six ounces more of cream to compensate? So on the, uh, if you look, uh, so on the ingredient guide, uh, we do make some truffles that don't have any liqueur in them. For example, we make a maple walnut. And since Don does the inside, maybe you want to comment about the um, amount of uh, maple syrup you put in? Yeah, so in that case, case, I'll put in six ounces of maple syrup as opposed to six ounces of other kinds of flavoring. I think in answer to the question, um, you could certainly try putting in 12 ounces of cream. You could also maybe put in 10 or 11. When we make our dark chocolate truffles, we do a couple of things differently. Um, we reduce the amount of general inside chocolate and increase the amount of unsweetened chocolate to make it even darker. And then for our flavoring, we use guitar liqueur, which is a chocolate liqueur, um, but it, it does have alcohol in it. So you could find yeah, what's that? What's that? Godiva. Godiva, Godiva. Godiva liqueur. liqueur. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. But I think you could just go with cream. Okay. And, you know, that's an experiment. And one of the things we're going to talk about is experimentation. Um, and then just one more question before we move on is, uh, does the flat side of the truffle um, come from the forming of the soft chocolate? I assume the settling. Uh, when you quickly mold the center with your hands, do you keep the flat side? Can you talk more about how you make sure you're putting the flat side on the cookie sheet? So there, let me answer part of it and Ellen can answer the other part. So. The flat sides initially created during the scooping process. And then when I roll them, I roll them so quickly and not very hard that the flat side roughly stays in place. I'm just trying to really smooth out the really rough edges. And then Ellen can talk about how she gets the flat side to go down when she dips. Right, so when I'm dipping, there's, I know there's gonna be a flat side or a flatter side and then a round side. So I try to put the basket uh, of the dipping utensil underneath the round side. And then, you know, so think of it as lifting that up straight uh, and then flipping it over so that the uh, uh, flat side is the one that hits the cookie sheet. Now, okay. some people will roll their inside chocolate in cocoa powder and that becomes the outside. And in that case, when you roll it, you do want it to be, be rounder, yeah. more of a ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Right. Well, thank you. Shall we continue? Okay, thank you all. Good questions. All right, so now we're moving into imagination. So in the flavor guide, as I've mentioned, those are the flavors that we've kind of settled on in the last uh, few years, the ones that we like the best. And there's certainly other liqueurs people uh, often use. Many people like a Kahlua truffle, but we're not big coffee drinkers, so we've kind of passed on that one. Uh, Amaretto is another one that we don't make. So certainly if uh, you like spirits and liqueurs, uh, 
you can you know go to your heart's content. And but then there's also um, non-alcoholic options with the various you know, jams. And so you could look at what uh, uh, some of the um, you know, berry ones that we have. And if they've got liqueurs in them, you could, and don't want a liqueur, you could add more of the um, uh, jam to them. And then I know people who make peanut butter uh, truffles or mashed up cookie truffles. And I've never tried those, so I can't really you know, give an opinion on what the best proportions would be, but that's something you could experiment with. And you can also experiment a little bit with sizes and shapes. So here's a couple of uh, ideas. So these are our private reserve truffles. Uh, we call them uh, gigorms, gigantic, enormous truffles. And I think my friend uh, coined that term. So for these, we use a larger melon scoop. And we actually use an even darker uh, mix on the inside chocolate. And then what we do is we double dip them in white compound wafers. And uh, uh, the reason they have to be double dipped is when you first start, start off with your uh, dipping bowl full of nice uh, white compound wafers, after you've uh, put several um, uh, dark centers into dip, you'll notice that it's starting to become a little bit more like uh, mocha or cafe au lait, and it kind of gets a little darker as you go through. So what I do then is just let them set and then go back and dip them again in another uh, round of white compound wafers and that's usually uh, quite enough to keep them looking uh, very light outside. Then the other thing we'll do with this is um, you know, decorate them in different ways. So the right-hand one has uh, melted chocolate drizzled over it. So just melt some chocolate, and that could be either the outside or the inside chocolate, uh, and put, you know, put a fork into it. And then put the fork several inches above the truffle, and, and you can go back and forth and make uh, um, lines like I did, or you could try to make swirls, like uh, do it in a circular fashion, or you can do like what's on the left, which is just to take the truffle, dip it upside down in uh, dark melted uh, chocolate, and then you've got a, a cap on the uh, truffle. And those are really good. Then another thing that we did you know, for several years around uh, 2005, is we uh, did a batch of animal truffles and for several years in a row, we would uh, enter a different animal truffle in the Alameda County Fair. And so on the upper left, we had the March of the Penguins. In the upper right, we had panda berry truffles. And uh, that was uh, berry flavor on the inside and the uh, white chocolate uh, outsides were decorated with uh, uh, arms and uh, eyes, nose and mouth and ears. And then we had a um, uh, maple walnut truffle on the left. And that was a, uh, a chipmunk holding a, a walnut. We had bald eagles and uh, snowy owls. And what we found that works best with these, you can think of roly poly animals, you know, you know bears, uh, the, you know, the chipmunk wasn't too bad. Border collies would not make good truffles because they tend to be very long and very lean and very low to the ground. Uh, so what, um, what we've done with these is make two sizes. The bottom is a little bit bigger than the top and the bottom has uh, two sides, two opposite sides flattened uh, in, in, uh, rather than just one. And then we dip all the truffles, wait until they're set and join the smaller uh, top, the flat part of that to one of the flat tops on the bottom and uh, join together with the coating chocolate, and then you can uh, paint a design on with a brush. So for example, the um, penguins, uh, they were uh, dipped in dark for the head, the body was dipped in white, and then I uh, painted dark chocolate wings and back on them. And that, so, but they were a little uh, challenging because of the beak. And I tried, first tried like a carrot, and that didn't work at all because you know after a while it uh, uh, just kind of sagged. So then I came up with the idea of the toothpicks, and uh, you know it just decorated with food coloring. Now, if you're going to be going to a party or giving any of these away, you'll want to prevent marring. Uh, 
because uh, if they jostle against each other, they're going to chip off a little bit of the chocolate and not look good. So there's a couple of things you can do on here. Uh, one are candy cups. Just make sure that it's uh, the candy cup is the right size for the uh, truffle. Uh, then there are these colored foils uh, that can be found uh, in baking stores and online. And if worse comes to worse, uh, one can use plastic wrap and cut it into squares, which I hate to say years ago I did uh, for many, many truffles until I discovered these wonderful foils. If you're going to be making multiple flavors, uh, particularly if you're going to give them away, uh, you'll want to distinguish what they are. And that could be simple to fancy. You know, just write it on a piece of paper or an index card. Or since we uh, still do this in some volume, uh, we've created these uh, hand gen or computer generated uh, labels. And again, if you're going to be delivering or shipping these, uh, you may want to put them in bags or boxes and you can find a lot of nice fancy ones around the holiday period. There were years that we did a lot of mailing. Uh, and so uh, we would use these one piece foldable boxes which come in different sizes. And um, uh, we either put them in an additional box or a padded envelope so they didn't get squashed by whatever mailing service you were using. And if we use the boxes, we'd put a two from label and a flavor label on it. So Don's gonna talk about where we get everything. So, but, but before I do that, let me say, we've taken you through almost 48 pages of instructions. And so I can imagine that some of you are thinking, this looks awfully complex. So I just wanna emphasize that this is actually a very forgiving recipe. As long as you don't burn the chocolate, you can change the proportions of things we've made Truffles where the flavoring is 100% alcohol to, um, to truffles where there's no alcohol in the flavoring. We've changed the amount of cream and the amount of flavor in it. We've let them sit for a few days versus you know, doing, doing things immediately. So um, don't be intimidated by the fact that there's lots of pages. So now let me talk about where we get stuff. So the first thing, of course, you need is chocolate. So your better supermarkets are going to have baking sections where they will have good bar chocolate. Um, and that's what you need really for the inside. And then some of them will have the appeals or the candy melt. We've gone to a specialty cooking and baking store called Spun Sugar in Berkeley. And they sell guitar chocolate in bulk and we buy it that way. We also buy compound flavorings from them and also some of the oils. So, and then we're always on the lookout for um, other sources. So for example, Ellen has a, a colleague who has a walnut orchard. So we get our walnuts from him, including red skin walnuts. Um, so it, it's just a constant search. Your gift stores and online are also other places to get your chocolate from. In terms of the flavorings, I'd recommend that you look at the handout that you could access called what to buy and where to find it because you never know where a good flavoring is gonna show up. And depending upon where you live will probably determine where you go for your flavorings. In terms of dipping utensils, there are many choices online and some of the big box general and craft stores also have dipping utensils. In addition, you can use a fork. The wrapping foils, um, we happen to use five inch square for most truffles. If it's one with a walnut or a mint chip on top, we use a six inch square for that. If you're just getting small volumes, you can go to cooking and baking stores and online. Large volumes, the handout contains an online supplier. For boxes and bags, there are many stores, especially around the holidays, where you can go online. For the bowls, you know, essentially go look in your cupboard, um, go to cooking stores, go online. And as Ellen said, she's finally selected these bowls that come from craft fairs. And I think the name of the vendor is included in the um, information. And they're located in the Central Valley. So. All right, so we're, we are almost done here. And so there's a few frequently asked questions. So the first one is on tempering. So do I have to temper the chocolate? And what is tempering anyway? So a few years ago, uh, we attended uh, a lecture actually by a representative uh, from Guitar who came out to the Lafayette Library and went through a lot of this. 
So uh, pro uh, tempering is the process of raising and cooling the temperature of the inside chocolate, which is called couverture if it's a high quality chocolate, to change the crystal structure so that it is what is called glossy, firm, melts near body temperature, and has what is called a good snap. So if you want to use couverture for the dipping chocolate, it will need to be tempered. Otherwise, it's going to uh, melt at a much lower temperature than you want. And I once saw a really good episode of the Great British Baking Show, and the assignment was to make truffles. And boy, did they get critiqued on their tempering. So that for us would be another significant step. So there is this alternative, which is the compound chocolate, like the Guitard Appeals or Wilton Candy Melts, and you can uh, use that for the dip, uh, dipping chocolate. And again, it, uh, it has a different oil in it rather than uh, uh, cocoa butter. So how long can the unused chocolate be stored? So for our experience is that the inside and unsweetened chocolate keep pretty well. Uh, sometimes there's a discoloration due to temperature changes. And really what's happening is the cocoa butter is rising to the surface and it's, you see a lightening and it's, and it's called bloom, and you can read more about that on the internet, but it, you know, I don't believe it affects the flavor at all. So what, what we have found is there does seem to be a change to fluidity of the compound chocolate if we've stored it over a long period of time. So usually we try to wrap up our truffle making by late winter or early spring, and then we don't pick it up again to the fall. So there were years that we were storing a, a fair amount of compound chocolate over the summer. And I didn't think that it really uh, performed as well as I would have liked it to. So now we just try to make sure we've used everything up by around the end of March. Uh, so whether it's the compound chocolate or chocolate chips or mint chips like we use for our mint truffles, uh, if you want to use those, the, uh, just melting those, they don't seem to have as good a fluidity as I would like, but they can be improved by uh, putting in some vegetable oil or using a product called, such as something called Paramount Crystals, uh, which is, would be a vegetable oil based. And you put in a little bit of a time when you're melting it until you've uh, achieved the desired fluidity that you want. And I've looked online, you can, you can buy Paramount Crystals online, you can also buy them at Spun Sugar if you're local. And a few more uh, FAQs, how long do the truffles last? So there's no preservatives in this recipe. Uh, they certainly will keep for several weeks, but I wouldn't keep them indefinitely, particularly if you've got nuts or coconut or a fruit in them. Uh, and I've personally have never understood why people wanted to keep them for long periods of time, because we find that truffles are best eaten ASAP. Can I make white chocolate truffles? So white chocolate is softer and harder to work with. And while it has cocoa butter, what it doesn't have are some of the cocoa solids that get added back to uh, uh, dark chocolate during the uh, processing phase going from cocoa beans to final chocolate product. So you may have to freeze the centers before dipping or take chilled ones out of the refrigerator just a few at a time to dip. I have a friend who makes white chocolate truffles, but I think she has elves in her house and their assignment is to run back and forth to the freezer uh, to bring her one truffle at a time. We sometimes use the white compound uh, chocolate for dipping, but as I said, that needs to be double dipped in two sections Otherwise, you won't have a pristine white color on the outside. Can I make truffles in the summer? Uh, yes, but the room needs to be cool enough to dip. Uh, and we prefer the house to be at 68 degrees or lower when I'm doing the dipping. So depending on the weather or if you live in a warm climate, you may have to run the air conditioning for hours. Those years that uh, we were doing the animal truffles for the Alameda County Fair, which runs from the end of June into the beginning of July, it didn't matter what day I was assigned to bring the uh, truffles in, it was going to be 100 degrees that day and the day before. So I'd be getting up at five o'clock in the morning to turn the air conditioning on to keep the uh, uh, kitchen at 68 degrees. So this does it for our presentation.
So I wanted to say thank you, and then we'll take some more questions. We really appreciate having all of you here. Um, this is the largest audience we've ever had for a truffle making session. We hope you enjoyed it and you'll start making truffles in your own kitchen as soon as the weather allows. In a few days, you're gonna get an email from Chris that will provide you with a link to this session. And it will also have the email address for Mountain Dog Truffles. So if you have a question you wanna ask us directly, you can do that. But we'd like to see if you have any other questions now. It looks like you've got a couple guys. Um, let's see now. I think some of these you already answered, but um, one was um, how does using a flavored oil, which is a few drops versus a liquor or preserve, which is a few ounces, affect the metals? Are there any changes that should be made based on the type of flavoring? So I found that the, we use a few drops of flavoring in, in some of these. I think the oils we use are probably mostly for hard candy and we're using it just to increase the intensity of the flavor. Um, I, I guess I haven't even thought about doing just the drops of flavor as opposed to the volume. Right, I think Because again, the, the whole, the mix talks about sort of 12 ounces of, of uh, cream and flavoring per pound of chocolate. So we've just sort of stuck to that because we know that works. Do you think you you think it would be overwhelming? To, uh, and plus, you know, they're, they 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 probably be very expensive. If, right. I think it and, depends on the oil. Okay. We have more than a, a more than one per, uh, people asking where they can buy your truffles. Uh, we don't sell. We don't sell them. <laughs> we just give them away at, toward, toward the end of the year. We are not a commercial kitchen. Right. <laughs> um, and then. Um, yeah, if we add flavors, uh, such as maple syrup, do we subtract from the 17 ounces of inside chocolate? No, no, no. So the maple syrup, so the basic recipe is 17 ounces of inside chocolate or whatever proportion of that you want to make, six ounces of cream and six ounces of flavorings. So if your flavoring is maple, then you add six ounces of maple syrup. And then to that one, since we make maple walnut, we'd also cut up some walnuts and throw those in as well. Okay. Um, and let's see here. I guess a technical definition question. Does setting just mean cooling to room temperature? Yes. Okay. Um, I had a question. Uh, do we get to see any actual mountain dogs this evening? <laughs> they're in well, there. They're in their room. Well, <laughs> right. We, we, we would have had a lot of barking. So when we, when we have practiced this, uh, sometimes they've been in the room and one in particular really likes to have all the attention and that's cloud. <laughs> I think if we've all learned any lesson from a year of the pandemic, it's to put the, the pets in the other room while you're on a meeting. <laughs> um, we have uh, lots of non-questions, just tons of accolades coming in, just people really um, okay. thanking you for the fantastic presentation. And I wanna also thank you for this. Um, uh, I feel like we've been uh, working for many, many months to put this together, and I'm really glad that we're able to, um, to finally present it to so many people this evening. Well, it's been a pleasure, and for those of you in Lafayette and Contra Costa, we'll see you around town. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, and uh, everybody attending, um, as soon as we have the videos online, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna send out a, a follow-up email, and that'll have the link for that, and also the email address that if you have any further questions, or if we didn't get to your question this evening, that you can, you can email those in. Um, or you have a question when you're in the middle of making it. <laughs> yep, <laughs> there's that too. And, and we know this recipe works because when we've done the in-person uh, classes, occasionally, uh, people have come back and said they have, they've made them, they've gone to the store, they've bought the ingredients, followed the recipe, and they want us to try them. And sure enough, it tastes just like ours. Right. <laughs> so. Sometimes better. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, I hope you two have a good evening and everybody at home, I hope you do as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And thank everyone.